Hi, my name is Carrie, and I'm an educator at the San Antonio Museum of Art. I'm here for story time. This week's story is a folktale from Papua New Guinea. That's an island that's near Australia. And if you remember from some of the other stories we've done, folktales often try to explain how things came to be and maybe explain why things are a certain color or act a certain way. And in this particular story, it explains why some animals look the way that they do. So our story comes from this book and it's called The Turtle and the Island and it's full of stories. And these stories don't have a lot of illustrations. So I'm gonna start by showing you the illustration from the book then we're going to move on to an artwork that's at the San Antonio Museum of Art in the Oceanic Gallery. And I'll give you a hint, it's an animal and you can try to see what you think it is. So after the story, I've got another art challenge for you. So make sure you stick around for that. All right, are you ready to get started with the story? Today's story is from Turtle and the Island, Folk Tales from Papua New Guinea collected by Donald S. Stokes, retold by Barbara Kerr-Wilson, and illustrated by Tony Oliver. The Witch's Fire. In the days long ago, when men first started to live in the world, they had no fire. Without fire to warm themselves, they shivered through the cold nights. Without fire for cooking, they ate food raw. Gradually, a few people discovered how to kindle the warm, leaping flames and then fire brought a new comfort into their lives. In the area around Bougainville, the first to discover fire, were some witches who lived on a tree-clad mountainside. The people who lived down below in the coastal villages knew about the witches' fire and longed to share it. But the witches kept the secret of kindling it to themselves and would not give away any of the fire. Several times the elders of the largest village at the foot of the mountains sent tribesmen to barter for a piece of the witch's fire. Always the tribesmen returned empty-handed. At last the elders gathered in their meeting house and decided that they would make one more attempt. They would send a dog to steal a piece of the fire. They called in the most intelligent dog in the village and told him what he was to do. Straight away, the dog went into the bush and collected four friends to help him in his task. A green feathered parrot, a possum with a long bushy tail, and a long tailed frog, for in those days, all frogs had tails, and a pig. The dog drew up a plan of action. He placed his four friends in different positions along the path that led to the witch's camp. A high koala tree marked the beginning of the path, and the parrot flew up and perched on one of its branches. Halfway along, the path crossed a river. The possum sat on one bank and the frog on the other. The pig waited just a short distance from the camp, near the end of the path. Now the dog set off. He swam across the river and followed with his nose the smell of burning wood that came from the witch's fire. When he reached the camp, the witches, wearing bark cloaks, were huddled around their fire, for it was a cold morning. The flames, orange and red and yellow, leapt upwards. The witches did not take much notice of the dog. When he asked if he might warm himself by the fire, they made a place for him. Now, as everyone knows, the warmth of a fire can make one feel drowsy and sleepy, and gradually the witches began to doze and snore. The dog watched as one by one their heads nodded and dropped and their eyes closed. Then he inched his way right to the fire, seized a piece of the burning wood in his mouth and ran off with it. The witches heard the dog running away quickly, opened their eyes, saw what he had done, shook off their sleep and began to chase him, shrieking and yelling with rage. Panting, the dog reached the place on the mountain path where he had left the pig. He gave a piece of the burning wood to the pig, who ran with it until he came to the river. Meanwhile, the dog escaped into the bush, leaving the witches to chase after the pig. On the side of the river, the frog sat waiting. The pig tied the piece 
from burning wood to the frog's tail, and then the pig too escaped into the bush. The witches threw aside their bark cloaks and jumped into the water and swam after the frog, but the frog reached the other bank just ahead of them. Just as he reached the bank, however, where the possum was waiting for him, the fire burned right through his tail, which dropped off, and that is why today frogs have no tails. While the frog leapt into the water and swam away, the possum ran on with a piece of burning wood. The witches scrambled out of the river onto the outer banks, pursuing the possum. The possum ran and ran until he reached the tall koala tree where the green feathered parrot sat waiting. Just as he scrambled onto the lowest branch of the tree, one of the witches caught up with him and took a hold of his long bushy tail. The possum scrambled upward and managed to break free from the witch's grasp. But in doing so, he lost all the hair on his tail and the witch was left with a handful of fur. And ever since, most possums have had bare skinny tails. Now the witches stood under the koala tree, watching the possum climb up and up until he reached the green parrot who was perched on the topmost branch. He gave the piece of fire to the parrot who flew away with it in his beak. And when the witches saw that, they realized there was no more they could do and they gave up the pursuit. Swiftly, the parrot flew over the treetops to the village by the sea from which the dog had set out. As he flew, the fire singed and burned the green feathers of his breast so that they glowed red. Ever since that time, he has had a red breast. How gladly the villagers welcomed the parrot when he flew into their midst bearing the precious fire that they had coveted for so long. Now they would no longer shiver in the cold. Now they could at last cook their food and need no longer to eat raw meat. They fetched bundles of dry wood and built a huge fire on their own. And a few days later, they made a big feast to which they invited the dog and his four valiant friends, the parrot, the possum, the frog, and the pig. Did you enjoy the story? And what kind of animal was that? That's right, of course it was a pig. And this pig that we have in the gallery at the San Antonio Museum of Art was made with natural resources. So the artists would have taken things that they would have found naturally in the environment and they wove them together to create this pig. So my art challenge for you today is actually to create a weaving. And I'm gonna show you step by step how to make stuff that you can find just from your backyard and create your own weavings. Let's get started. All right, so this is my weaving. This is the final product. So what you wanna do is go gather some things from your yard, some sticks, some plants. Make sure you ask your parent or an adult which plants are okay for you to use for this project. You're also gonna need some string and some yarn. So the first thing I did was find four sticks about the same size. I'm gonna use these to create my loom in which to weave on. And you could pick sticks of different size, or you could even pick like three sticks and make a triangle, anything works. But just to keep it simple for now, I picked four sticks about the same size. So next thing we're gonna do is take just two sticks and lay one on top of the next. And then I'm gonna take some string and I'm going to tie those two together. And you're gonna do this just by crisscrossing and going underneath and overlapping a few times and then tie it in a knot. You're gonna do that with all four corners of the sticks until you get kind of a frame just like this. Next, you're gonna take some yarn or string, whatever you have at home really, and you're gonna tie it to one of the four corners and make sure you've got a lot of um, string to use. Next, what you're going to do is you're going to loop the yarn around the sticks at the top and the bottom. And when you're doing this, if you loop around about twice, it keeps it from slipping and holds it in place. And it also gives you enough spacing between the um, pieces of yarn in order for you to weave. When you're all finished, you're gonna tie it off in a knot in the other corner, kind of opposite corner from where you started. And now you're ready to weave. So I took some 
pieces of a plant I had in my front yard that were kind of long, skinny, palm-like leaves. And what you wanna do is you just wanna start going over and under, over and under, all the way across your loom. So next, you're gonna bring a new piece of grass or yarn or leaves or whatever it is that you're weaving with, and you're going to make the opposite pattern. So if you started under and you went under, over, under, over, under, over, this next one you're gonna do the opposite. And you'll go over, under, over, under, over, under. You're going to repeat the same process layering all kinds of different materials. This next piece, I used a branch that actually had a flower on it. You can use anything. And you're just going to weave them and repeating the pattern and doing the opposite on the next line. And keep going all the way until you fill your loom. So as you get to the top of your loom, it gets a little harder to do. So I recommend kind of giving yourself a lot of space and weaving kind of higher. And then you can use your fingers and slide the pieces closer together. You're gonna keep repeating that process until you're all finished. I decided to take my weaving all the way to the top of my loom and I have pieces of a plant, I have some rosemary um, and another plant that have flowers. So you can, again, you can use anything that you want. And when you're all finished, you can display it on your wall or give it as a gift or keep it for yourself, whatever you want to do. All right, that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining me for the story and the artwork. I don't know about you, but I find weaving really relaxing and I hope that you make your own weaving. And if you do, I also hope that you'll share it with us. You can take a picture and leave it in the comments of any of our social media um, platforms, or you can email it to me as well. I can't wait to see what you make. All right, until next time, bye.